tonight. We're going to depart from our, our uh, usual sweet spirit, wisdom, power. Maybe apply all three to uh, something here in the book of Amos. So turn with me to the book of Amos chapter 7. chapter 7. And we'll start reading here in verse 7 and then read through oh, the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pa pass by them any more, and the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise again against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. <clears throat> then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there, but prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son but I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, go, prophesy to, unto my people Israel. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore thou sayest the Lord, thy wife shall be an harlot in the city and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword and thy land shall be divided by, by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of, this, of his land. So let's have a word of prayer. We'll get, get going. Father, we, we thank you for, for your work. Uh, we thank you for your church, for your people that make up your church. And we come before you because we have a, a spiritual need. It's the middle of the week. There's a lot of accumulation of junk and garbage that tends to stick to us by now. And we need the washing of your word in our lives. So I pray that uh, by being here and by going through these things, uh, we will leave here uh, more challenged to to live for you and to uh, do what we know we should be doing. And uh, so I just pray you'd, you'd be with the entire study here and that your will might be accomplished in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I believe because of, not only because of what I'm going to say, but because of Hebrews 11, uh, that the Lord has never left himself without a witness. In Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So the, the heavens are a testimony. Or they're a witness. Uh, so Amos prophesied to the northern tribe of Israel, ten tribes, but also to the whole family of Jacob, which of course would be Judah. Now, as you read through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, major prophets. Sometimes they, they tell you how long the prophets served. Several of them were in 40s and 50s, years. Anybody have any idea how long Amos served? 
It's not said here. It's approximately six months. That's it. So sometimes, you know, we get all caught up in numbers and think that some things are much more important. But Amos had a, Amos had a purpose for what the Lord wanted him to do. And we'll, when we get to his background, uh, he called him out of that background. And when he was done, he went back to it. And, and the Lord was happy with what he did. So uh, he spoke concerning upcoming judgment, dispersion, and then ultimately to, at the very end in chapter 9, a complete restoration. Uh, and the personal testimony of Amos is recorded here should, and I hope, lead us to some characteristics of true witness bearing. So I have a few things to say here. Number one, uh, Amos had a message from God. Go down here for verse seven in these three verses. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto to me, well, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not rise again. I will not again pass by them anymore. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise again against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So he first he mentions this plumb line. A plumb line is an instrument of testing. Uh, a mason used to use a plumb line to gauge the straightness of a wall. Sometimes I think now they use, they use uh, laser. But when we were studying this book, I think probably eight, a good part of 20 years ago, we took a plumb line somewhere in here and we used it to measure the straightness of a particular wall. And it came close. But it's not straight. And that could be because of the sheetrock of Boeing or in one way or another. But it really set the, if you want something to be straight, you use a plumb line. And, and so God tests the character of human actions with a plumb line. So what is the plumb line? Well, number one, I believe it's his law of creation within the conscience of all, all, the, all mankind. In Romans chapter one, I believe that there's an innate thing within us that says this did not just all of a sudden happen. It doesn't tell us who did this, or who created this, but it tells us it, didn't, it just didn't explode and then materialize. And the road to, to knowing uh, the Lord and salvation is to admit, you know, there's a creator here. And then, of course, we get to the rest of the word and shows us who he is. And number two, his written word of the scriptures by which he tries or tests all who, who possess this revelation. So, again, in a progressive revelation situation, if you believe what God said about creation, then... He's going to test you by the, by the written word uh, if you possess that so that you, many people believe in creation, deny Christ. It's remarkable. I mean, and, and buy into the, the, the worst situations. Uh, and then number three, uh, his law as lived out in Christ by which he tests all those who have the gospel. So God's wall has but one foundation. And so walls are built not upon two or more foundations, but one, the Lord Jesus Christ. So much is revealed about you and about me, how you build on the foundation or how you build on foundations. We either build everything that we have on, on the Lord Jesus Christ, or we start going beyond that, and we create a foundation. But it's not biblical. 
It's man-made. So the Lord had come to, Mo, to Amos to measure the high places in the sanctuaries of Israel to expose their, their apostasy. So what I'm doing, I want to take what he was there to do and then make a kind of present day application to all of this. And so the point here, to me, the point here is that Amos had a message from God, something definite to say in the name of the Lord, something that was not manufactured to please the people, like excuses, or to show forth the gifts that Amos had been given. Sometimes people are prone to, to have a, a knowledge of spiritual gifts and they like to let other people know they, they have that. And they want you to be, if you don't have that, they, I don't know, whatever, if whatever it is, he, he didn't do it that way. But there was something that burned within his own heart. Uh, hold your place here. We'll go to a lot of scripture. In Jeremiah chapter, chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. As you, as you read through the, the book of Jeremiah, you see how difficult it was to serve the Lord and give out the, the truth of God's message. And he was, he was renounced, he was, he was not believed. Uh, it just, and it began to wear on him. And in verse 20, look down here in verse nine, he came to this place. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary for, with forbearing and I could not stay. It was what was in his heart that, that dictated over the circumstances that were going on and what he had. So we learned that the early apostles, after the resurrection, had such a vision of the power of Christ and the gospel of Christ that their hearts became inflamed, basically with, with divine passion to speak forth the good news. When the resurrection happened, and, and, and when what I just said, it didn't take a year. It didn't take five years. It was instant. That was the power of the resurrection. When we, when we were talking or if, uh, about what happened afterwards and what, what happens afterwards today, why are we not seeing that? Don't we still have the same power, the same promise? Yes, and yet it seems like we, we have to gravitate and we have to work up being really filled and, and just inflamed to, to get the word out to live for him. So Acts chapter four, Acts chapter four. There's one, one basic instance, there are many more. Acts chapter four, and this is after, after they were told, the, the, the apostles, uh, that they were not allowed to preach in Jesus' name. They were not allowed to talk about the resurrection. And this, Peter and John, verse 19, answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. See, they truly had a message, a message that came to them with such commanding authority that their whole body, soul, and spirit were brought into subjection to it. Sometimes we, we try to divide all of this up and we think, okay, I've got this in, in my heart, I've got this in my mind, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have sway in, in, in my body. And so knowing that, then I think it's proper to ask ourselves, have you lost that vision? Or have we, has a local church lost that vision? We can't afford to do that. Are our ears dull of hearing? Or have our hearts become hardened because we're so familiar with passages and phrases of scripture that we've lost the spiritual joy 
of the message that's been given to us, entrusted to us. So I look and I think, I have the same message of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Um, I have the same promise of the, of the indwelling power. But then you ask, well, where's, where's our faith? Uh, we're, we're told to, God promises us something, and then he delivers, and we're to trust them. So our, our first point here is Amos had a message from God, and he gave it out. It's important to know. A lot of people have given a message. They don't give it out. They just store it up. Okay, number two. We'll go down here to verse 10 and read this little four-verse section here. He suffered oppression. Amaziah, <clears throat> then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel, and the land is not able to bear his, all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be, be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there, but prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and the king's court. So Amaziah the priest misrepresents both Amos and his message to the king. And then hypocritically demands that he go back into the land of Judah. All right, so we have modern day priests of Bethel. And oftentimes they do the same thing or worse to either God's people or God's man or both uh, who will boldly declare the whole counsel of God. They do not want that. They, don't, they are not going to do it for their people or with their people. They don't want you to do it. Uh, for yours, and most of that comes from false religions and cults. But there's another, another group that come close to, to us, and they have spiritual agendas foreign to God's word, either in doctrine or practice. And, and so they bring oppression, they can bring oppression or ridicule. But haven't we already been forewarned of that? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. And of course the context of, of chapter 3 is, is in verse 1, just the beginning. This know also that in the last times, perilous times shall come. And then there's a list. Then you go down to verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall work, wax worse and worse, deceiving and, and being deceived. And then can, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Okay, so it shouldn't be an, a novel thing that if there's oppression to giving forth the word in, in power. Go to First Peter chapter 4. I'll put these two together. First Peter chapter 4. And look at verse 12. Now when Peter was giving this, very shortly after he gave that, Nero set the Christians up on his crosses and used them as light poles. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers with Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If he be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Listen, if we are speaking God's word in God's name with God's power, the Holy Spirit, then leave it to him to care for his own, we who are saved. He said it's going to happen. And if we're going to do this, we should not be surprised that it, that it happens. So we headed out to Montana. 
in the uh, mid-70s in faith and that the Lord would want us there. And after we got there, there were a few obstacles uh, that popped up. Uh, number one, we were in a motel, I had to look for work. I had to, we were looking for a house or an apartment. And so everything was dependent. He had no, he had no internet, he didn't have any of that. And so there, there was nowhere to go at that particular time. And then we had an incident at the motel with a German shepherd and he, he got out, chased the squirrel up the light pole and the light pole touched the live wire and he became toast, blackened toast and he fell down in the dumpster. All right, that's not bad enough. It set the entire area that we were staying without any power. So that's, that's the humorous part. We needed, we needed to have insurance, uh, car insurance. And so somebody recommended a guy who is with a, a company. And so he came to the motel. We got to talking and found out that he already... He already knew who I was and what I came to do. And he told me, and it was very strange, in no uncertain time terms, that I was not needed or wanted there. And I really should go back home. Uh, what he was saying is that there's no room here for, for Bible-believing uh, people. Basically, that's what it was. And he thought that he knew all about what I believe, and that me being younger than he was, that I was intimidated. Uh, well, I pressed him on, on uh, what he believed, where he was from, what, if he went to church. And so he was with the Church of Christ. The church of Christ can be very militant against the truth. We found that when we were, when we were in the baseball ministry and we were playing a school from the Church of Christ, they were hateful afterwards when we were talking to him. Anyway, um, so knowing that they didn't believe that salvation is by grace through faith alone and that there are five steps and one of them, the pivotal one, is you have to go into baptismal waters and then you get, you're regenerated by baptism. So I, I pressed on and on and uh, went to work to the best I could. About an hour and a half later, he wrote the policy, wished us well, and only the Lord could have done that. But he had a gross misinterpretation and a gross misunderstanding of me and my beliefs. And really about the word of God and what it teaches. So you see how that can work where people don't want the truth. I, mean, I could have been I could have been a Muslim. Uh, I could have been another denomination. I don't think there would be any problem. But the fact that we were Bible-believing people, uh, that there was something different. So we, we know that not only did, did Amos have a message from God, there was, there was also oppression. And that usually comes after we become really active in giving out God's word. All right, number three. He gave his personal experience. Verse 11. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. That's pretty dangerous stuff. Verse 14. Then answered Amos, and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Now I want you to know that what he's saying there bears no reference of his inexperience. He was not a prophet or his education. Let's put it this way, his lack of education. He didn't go to the right schools. He didn't go to any school. Sometimes 
you, know, you don't have to depend on the help of, of schools to receive God's word, to call to the ministry. You don't. You don't. Uh, and again, we're not chosen because we're wise and we're strong, but because we're willing. And, and fit instruments of, of, for the exhibition of his wisdom and power in salvation, in the Christian life, all of it. Go over here to Luke 22. Luke 22. And let's start here in verse 24. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief is he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may be able to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So there, you know, it's happening, the same thing that happens today. There's, 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 you get into this thing, it's who's better, who's, who's smarter, who's wiser, who's greater. But greatness... True greatness never finds out that it's great. It just doesn't. It, it's, greatness is, take, is taken too much up, up with other people, thinking of others, serving other people, to think, hey, you know what? That's great. You're really great. <laughs> if you get to that place, you're not great. It just isn't. When anyone finds out that he's great, he ceases to be great. And most of the people, I don't like to, I don't like to see this, this is a great church and the greatness of this and the greatness of that because of the people inside. I remember sitting at a prayer meeting where some fellow came in, uh, uh, an associate of, of the preacher and uh, got up and talked about how great the preacher was and how lucky you are to have him as your preacher because he is great. And he went on for 15 or 20 minutes and I kind of elbowed Linda and I said, I wonder what he's gonna preach now. They're almost not even sinners. They almost don't even need to be saved. They don't need the gospel. They're every, I mean, they've arrived. If you, if you have discovered that you're humble, then you may know that you're not humble. These are not things that, that we know. Humility is absorbed with the Lord and with others. And, and, and really, I think a person that is humble never knows that he's humble. And, I, and when I say this, I say this in reference to the, what I read in, in Luke, it's very possible you, none of us are ever going to understand that until we see Christ face to face. Because, may, like it says, the Gentiles, this is the way Gentiles operate. And, and if, you've got a, a big, if you've got a big mega church ministry, man looks at it and says, it's great. It's a great ministry. Does God say that? I don't know. It may be in God's eyes, but as soon as we lower to us, I think then it ceases to be great. And oftentimes the preacher, the preachers, and there's usually eight to 10 or 20 of them, all think they're great. And it's not great. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians 
chapter 1. And again, this, this is all going to be brought back to Amos's personal testimony. 1 Corinthians, oh, sorry, I'm in 2nd. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and look down here in verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. It doesn't say none of them, it just says not many. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his sight. I've heard people that butcher the English language. Greatly used of God. I've heard the same people that, that mock him Useless. It's, it's not that. It's, you, now, somebody that glories in his, in his lack of, of education, in his speech, that's a different story. It's somebody that's doing the best they can with what they have. Hey, praise the Lord. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And what was, before I go to verse 10, what was one of the things that was in disarray in Corinth? They had four divisions. And they were followers of three men in Christ. And I guarantee you, in that division system, they all compared each other with each other except the Lord and thought that they were better and greater than the others. And so Paul takes them to task already in chapter one and lets them know, hey, you're not so great. And if you think you're so great, you're not gonna be used, usually. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 10. For his letters, this is Paul's letters, say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So many times we look at the surface, we look at the appearance. Paul was nothing to be, if we saw Paul speaking here and we didn't know who he was, we would think, who is this guy? But if we read his letters, whoa, this is somebody greatly used of the Lord. And he started all these churches and won all these people to Christ. So. I think it's important for uh, the ministry, the personal ministry, our church ministry, that we are able to give personal testimonies as to what God has done or is doing. Whether that's, again, personal or collectively, that's important. When we, and I say this not to criticize, I'm saying, does anybody have a word of testimony? There ought to be every hand up. What is God doing? What has he done? Look what he did. He, he, gave, he gave me the life to get here tonight. The, the ability to do what I do. I mean, I had no promise of getting here tonight, but he get, got me here. I mean, got me through today, what if, what, all the things that I've done, and all of you, the same thing. Many other people know. Proverbs 4 say that out of the heart are the issues of life. And so apart from there, apart from what's in the heart, you know, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of sounding and intensity. But the, but the significance of that in God's sight is, is basically nothing. And by that, what I mean by that, you know, we're to speak what we already know and testify of what we've seen. So I use 1 John 5, 13 as an example. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. All right, so if I know I have eternal life, I can speak on 
security of the believer, right? Because I have that. I have other verses to back it up. There are a lot of people, semantically speaking, or, or theologically speaking, that don't know they have eternal life. And they'll speak on it. And when you challenge them, they don't know where to go. They don't even know what, what's going on. They think they're saved today, but they don't know about tomorrow. Well, I thought everlasting life was everlasting. So that, that's, imp that's important. If, if we give out beyond the measure of our own faith, I think that's very little honor to God. The apostles were eyewitnesses of his majesty before they were sent out to preach and teach and witness. So Amos had a message from God, and he gave it out. And he was very bold to give. He, he spoke before the king and said, you're going to die. And then later on, what's going to happen to your wives and your children and everything else? That's pretty bold. If you ever read some of the messages from Billy Sunday and some of those, the people that were back then that were preaching, Gypsy Smith, Christmas Evans, and some of these, Hari Tori, Moody, they were bold. Sunday was especially bold because he dealt, he dealt with the, the crowds that were uh, blue collar workers, so to speak. And it, he just lit it up. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Uh, if you're not acquainted with Billy Sunday, you should read some of his, his messages. Uh, and I was saved a long time before I started reading them. And I, I would sweat <laughs> at what he was saying. We went to uh, Mars Hill and the church there. And they were an independent fundamental uh, Baptist church. And I sat there and I listened to him and I can't remember which time. And then on the way out I said, you know, you would be kicked out of a number of churches for saying what you say. But you can do that week after week after week and you know what happens? The same crowd can become hardened to, to the same message, as bold as it is, as strong as it is, and we could see the same, the same thing happening that happens when, when it's not as, as strong and people drift, and they put up with what goes on, but people are people, and unless your heart's in it, you know, uh, Anyway, he gave it out, all right? So what's our message? Christ died for sinners, that, that was us. He came to seek and to save us. He died in our place. He, he shed his blood, paid the, 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 the debt of, of sin. He was buried, he rose again the third day. And our salvation is by grace through faith in him and that alone. And if you're not gonna believe that, then you're going to hell. And hell's not going to hold you too long, at least a thousand years, and then you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. And it's not going to be pretty. And you've got a choice. All right, Amos suffered opposition because of what he said, misrepresentation, lies, but yet he kept going. So if we've had any, if we've had any opposition, you know, We've, we've had opposition in, in, in the ministry. Most of it has not happened from outside, it's happened from inside. And that should never be, never. If, if we are truly brothers and sisters, there, there's no place for that. But boy, those knives have come out and they, they don't wait to face you, they, they just stab you right in the back and you twist that knife or throw it around and you just, you know, have to trust that the Lord's going to heal the wound and move on. You, you have to. And then number three, Amos testified of God's dealing with, with him. He was a nobody by the world standards. But he was willing to be used of God anyway. And God chose to, to use him. And when he was done, he went back to being a herdman. And I don't think he went back saying, well, 
I read about Isaiah in 50 some years, or Jeremiah in the 50 some years that he served. Why couldn't I serve longer? No, he did what God called him to do. And when it was over, that's it. And so I think there's some great things to learn, spiritually speaking, from, from Amos, his attitude, his boldness, and his perseverance. And the way we see things going on in the world and the way we see things going on in churches and church people, we better be prepared here and ready because if it's, if it's not here uh, now, it's coming. And we just pray that we'll keep busy for the Lord, keep our priorities right. Don't worry about a lot of things that are not worryable and uh, Stay strong in the Lord and keep trusting him. So let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this little study in Amos and what he represents to us today. There are many of the prophets of old that stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, people that had great power to, to kill them. And we read in the New Testament how the Lord Jesus Christ accused the Jews of killing the prophets, one after another after another. And then they even killed the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the truth is not popular, but the truth is the truth. And it's the truth that leads to eternal life. And we present the truth in its rawest form. We speak the truth in love, but it's still the truth. And we want to maintain that no matter how, how unpopular we may become or how persecuted we may uh, be because we've been told to, to give out the truth. And our testimony is, is still there. Uh, we are I think a group of dedicated nobodies. We're not trying to capture the attention of the world uh, or our state. We're seeking to capture the souls of men and women and boys and girls and, and to educate believers, not only in the truth, but to give out the truth and live for the truth and be active in it and to use what they know, not what they don't know. Because oftentimes it uh, creates problems. So speak to our hearts, I hope you have, and that we can take these things to our homes and uh, use them in the, the years, the months, the days, however long uh, you give us until you come for us. And we pray that that would be pretty soon. So dismiss us with your blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.